Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. As always, hit that subscribe button, everybody. We have an amazing show for you because boarding the mothership is Jim DeMonicos and Kevin Conrad Hanna. They are the documentary team behind Mike Minola drawing monsters. Now come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Domenicos and Mr. Hanna. How's it going, guys? Really good. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Totally my pleasure, guys. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm a um, big fan of Mike Manola. I want to see this documentary really badly. <laughs> well, we hope you get a chance. Right now, it's playing in a couple of film festivals in Australia. And uh, just next week, uh, we're going to be at Gen Con, where it's playing at the Gen Con Film Festival. And... Uh, we've applied to a number of other festivals, and little by little, uh, we should uh, be seeing it here and there. So hopefully you get a chance very soon. Coming so, soon to your neck of the woods. I, I, I am I'm hoping to. Like I said, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of the country right now, and I'm immensely jealous for those on the West Coast. Well, you know, we're going to be doing a big screening down in Los Angeles on August 13th, and so that's going to be a lot of fun. And... Yeah, I mean, I know coming from Rhode Island, that's that's no mean feat. So uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll find its way uh, to somewhere closer to you soon. <laughs> we'll just I will just throw out there, it's going to be a hell of a night. You know, plane tickets a little bit expensive right now, but I don't know, maybe worth looking into. It's going to be it's going to be a pretty amazing event. I'll have to do one of those um, event horizon wormhole things where I just fold the country <laughs> and end up on Los Angeles so I can watch it. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know that that works out well for the Event Horizon people. But. It it didn't. It totally didn't, but it may still yeah. be worth it. <laughs> okay. If you show up at the premiere with no eyes, I'm going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are a fan though, of the movie. That's fantastic. <laughs> so um, I always I'll start off with a question of influences and inspiration. So did your love of comic books or films come first, and who are your earliest influences? Kevin? Oh, all right. So uh, I was a comics first kid. Um, I, I grew up as an artist. I always wanted to draw. I didn't know what that meant. You know, I think we all grew up drawing. We just, a lot of us stop. I just never stopped. So I, I liked the attention that I got in kindergarten when I would draw Winnie the Pooh and I do it in perspective and all this other stuff. And so I just kept going. And um, I think like I was thinking about becoming an animator and then I realized I have to draw the same thing over and over and over again. And so then I discovered comics and I discovered, um, someone we'll talk about soon, but uh, Mr. Mike Mignola and uh, a lot of the people from the legend imprint at the time were a big influence on me. So the, the John Burns and Arthur Adams and Jeff Darrow's Frank Miller's. Um, and I just wanted to be a comic book creator. And, uh, but you know, it's comics are really hard to get into. And so I, I fell back into animation. And so I became an animator and then I became an animation director and then I became a director and then I became a director who was doing behind the scenes featurettes. And then I started you know, using, taking that to my advantage and started interviewing um, comic book creators when I could for like little TV stuff here and there. So, um, but I'm, I've always loved, I've always loved nonfiction storytelling. I've been a big fan of things like This American Life Forever. And um, this has just kind of been an opportunity to merge those two passions. Uh, for me, yeah, I've been chasing the same high as Kevin of getting any attention for drawing Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> uh, um, no, so I mean, uh, very much like Kevin, I started comics first. Um, I've been reading comics since I was uh, seven years old, and um, I've manifested my passion for comics in uh, many, many different ways. I I uh, used to own a chain of comic book stores. I was so I was a retailer. I was a um, marketing person for Image Comics. I started Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, and I did that. Um, I created the classic comic book spinner rack that I uh, did that on Kickstarter. And uh, this to me is essentially my latest iteration of my love, my longtime love letter to comics uh, and. Um, yeah, so for me, that's comics definitely came first. And then 
Um, it's just another way of uh, telling the stories of the people that we love and hear. Um, both of us are big fans of Mike Mignola and thus this uh, is kind of natural fit for, for our project. So how did you guys both meet and what, how do each of you complement the skills of the other individual? So we met through, uh, I mean, in a funny way, a couple of different ways. Uh, Kevin used to actually shop at my comic book store, um, but then he was also an exhibitor at my convention. And so we would just sort of see each other quite a lot uh, throughout and have over the last 20 years. And we sort of like come in and out of our, our lives together. It's like, Oh, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. Let's talk about something. We end up doing something. Then we like, don't see each other for a little bit, but you know, that's how I think, you know, that's how good friendships kind of work. They, um, they're, they evolve all the time and they're just part of something that they're part of your life, but they don't need to be this active thing 24, seven, 365. Um, as for skills, uh, it's funny, we were just talking about this a little earlier where um, because, of course, or maybe, yeah, because of being a convention organizer, I am very organized and I like the detail part of a lot of the things we do for our films, but also even just little things like, which are big things of uh, arranging travel and getting our, that kind of stuff taken care of. It's not like Kevin is weak at it. It's more, that's not his favorite thing to do. And so the flip side is that I can take care of stuff like that. I enjoy it and it's great. And I think that's just one of the ways, I mean, not, we haven't really gotten into the actual filmmaking part, but that's just one way that I think we complement each other really well in terms of who likes to do what and try to get those people, the people who enjoy what they do to be the, the that that's the, the what they do. Uh, on a project instead of uh, doing the things that maybe they're not the best at. Yeah, where where we overlap, we're both storytellers, we're both filmmakers, we both have like a passion for the subject and we're both good at like getting to the heart of it, the part that people will care about. Um, and then, and then you know, just the nuts and bolts of my background is uh, I'll, I'll lean more towards the, uh, we often will kind of divide and conquer. So when you go to someone's house, you're going into their, their home, you're going to their private studio, and you're invading and what'll happen is I'll often be like setting up equipment and Jim will start like this pre-conversation and make the person be at ease and get excited about talking about the stuff that they do. And then when we kind of, we kind of pinch hit on interviews, Jim will take some interviews, I'll do some interviews and sometimes it's kind of 50, 50. And, but by the time that we're there, cause it's really stressful to have like a crew of people come in and invade and just like setting up lights and all this kind of stuff. And Jim is very, very good at like getting, like getting them a sense about what we're going to be talking about, making them feel comfortable. And then, um, and then that way, when we start recording, um, Jim can make him cry on camera. <laughs> well, <Nailed> I, <laughs> I think my favorite part of the story is that you were a customer of, of, of his. And oh, yeah. it's it feel like the lesson to that is always grab your pull list. Don't leave. It <laughs> you don't know what can come from <laughs> being a good customer. That's right. <laughs> I was a regular customer. I don't know if I was a good customer. <laughs> I don't know that I always grab my full list, uh, but I should have. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Domenicos, as you mentioned, you were a showrunner at the Emerald City Comic Con. Now, as a convention showrunner, mm -hmm. what insights into comic books and your fans did this experience help develop for you? So, I think the fun thing about running a show is that you're trying to create an experience for a real multitude of fans right so i think the what you're looking at when you're creating an event is sort of what is going to what's going to make the most people happy and there's compromises in there to understand that like not everyone's going to like everything so doing a convention is creating enough experiences that most everyone is going to enjoy that maybe this part is not for them, but this part is. And translating that into making a film, a lot of that happens with editing, which is, okay, this is an interesting story. But if someone doesn't know who Swamp Thing is, is this story going to be relevant to them 
or is it just a good story for someone who likes Swamp Thing? And so it's almost the same thing where you look at it and say, you know what? I think I'm going to uh, take this story about Swamp Thing out and make the film tighter or put something else in there that's going to be more relevant to the general audience. And I feel like it's that type of thing, that curation of content that goes into making a film so that you can end up with a final product that you hope resonates with most of your viewers. Mm. So, and, and Mr. Hanna, you have a lot of experience with filmmaking and, be, and, and being a documentarian. So where did these skills come from and how different is developing a narrative for a documentary different from a film? Well, so this is my first full documentary, um, but I did, I did before this, I, I did a lot of like behind the scenes featurettes and I did a, a show for a uh, sci-fi channel that was like the behind the scenes for their Krypton show. Um, but uh, so, so to answer your question, what was your question? <laughs> so basically uh, two questions. One, like where did sure. you develop your skills for filmmaking and sure. how is developing a narrative for a documentary different than a regular film? Oh, sure. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I kind of went, to, so I was a Disney kid um, and I started working at the Walt Disney company when I was 26, I think. Um, and they just beat story into your head over and over and over again there. So it's very traditional. It's like you learn three act structure, hero journey, all that kind of stuff. And for a while I really rebelled against that and uh, tried to do things just avant-garde and that backfired. Don't do that. Just color in the lines for your first film. Um, but uh, so I, I made a film about a decade ago, uh, a, a different comic book movie. And um, uh, it, it didn't go as well as this one. Um, it, was a, it was a challenging production. But it was so interesting is that everyone wanted to talk about it. So I started interviewing my friends that had, had worked on it. And uh, we started like creating all these little behind the scenes featurettes. And I really enjoyed that. And I just liked the, truth, the truthfulness of it and crafting that into a narrative. And then I, and then I just kept doing that um, just off and on through the years. I was also doing video games and comics and animation and all this other stuff. But um, yeah, just recently I, I doubled down on it. And I was doing like behind the scenes featurettes for Sci-Fi Channel for... Um, Damien Chazelle's first man and stuff like that. And um, to answer your question, what's different is they're not actually that different. You still have to figure out like every scene has to have an arc. You have to have something that you care about in every scene. Um, something that, that Jim says a lot, which is very, very, um, has been one of our kind of guiding lights is that you can't just make Wikipedia the movie. You can't just <laughs> someone's accomplishments. You have to give them, well, us being ultra fans, we want as much information as possible, but you need to convey it in a way that's compelling to people. And you need to convey it in a way that, that you know, has stakes and that people understand those stakes. So I, I think documentary filmmaking, uh, unscripted filmmaking is, is more similar to traditional filmmaking than I think a lot of people might realize. Um, and I, I honestly, more than I realized. Uh, and I think working on this project, that's something that's really showed me is like, oh, you really need to like, around you know around the 20 to 30 minute mark you actually have to have a major change in the trajectory of the person's life or something like that and you know it works out well because that's how mike's story is mike's mike's real life journey is very much a classic hero's journey story like we didn't have to make it up or and that's the story of his life mm -hmm. um and it just it works very well to to the, the what you would see in like a, a narrative film so i'll, I'll say we've been mentioning that we're, we're talking about Mike Manola drawing monsters, which is the name of the film. Um, how did this idea come about? And at what point did Mike Manola get involved? I mean, did you ask him first and then go ahead or did you make this start making and going, please, Mignola, please get involved. And he finally <laughs> jumped in. I mean, how, how did this all work out? Well, it was a ladder. Um, <laughs> but do you, Jim, do you want to tell how, how our brains started? That's started? right. Sure. Uh, so it started like with most good ideas. It started with hamburgers. <laughs> um, so uh, Kevin and I, I, th I think I mentioned earlier, like, you know, we, we sort of, we see each other every so often. And so um, we, we were like, let's catch up. So this was pre pandemic. Um, we were like, let's um, let's just go have burgers. Uh, so we met up at a burger place and we started chatting. Like, what are you up to the usual catch up stuff? And, uh, he mentioned the uh, the stuff he was doing, like you 
mentioned earlier the stuff for Krypton and First Man. And it's like, yeah, you know. And we got into talking about the idea that like we never see this type of treatment for comic books. You know, you see these great behind the scenes. Like, there's probably a better document uh, documentaries about like tomatoes than there are actual like comic book creators. And so we're like, you know, there should be better. You know, we're big fans, but there should be better document documentaries about comics creators and in in the diy ethos it was like well if no one else is going to do it why don't we just do it and that's it's honestly how it started so um kevin you want to jump in with the rest or should i keep going yeah, yeah sure so you know originally we'd conceived it as a series you know something that we talked about is like our, our elevator pitch was chef's table but with comic book creators you know, there's a lot of, we really liked um, the, the Michael Jordan documentary. Um, there's a lot of documentaries that we're pointing at. We're like, let's do that with comic book creators, but let's do it as a series. And we're like, well, who do we start with? Like, who's, who's the creator that, you know, um, it's got a good personal life. It's important to us. You know, it also made it easier because we didn't have to do that much research because we already knew everything. Um, you know, and uh, like, like almost instantaneously, we were like, oh yeah, it's Mike Manuel all the way, right? And, uh, um, you know, from, from there, we were just like, yeah, that'd be really cool. And, you know, often you get these kind of lunches with, with cool people like Jim and, or whatever, and you talk about it, you don't actually do it. And um, I think one of the helpful motivators was that it was the 25th anniversary of Hellboy. And I think it was like two weeks later, it was the 25th anniversary, and they were doing a worldwide event. And uh, so we were like, okay, we're just going to do this. And um, we jumped into the deep end of the pool. We started contacting people all over the world. So for those who don't know, Hellboy Day was this event where at comic book stores and comic book clubs around the world, people were just coming in celebrating Hellboy in whatever ways. It was like free free things and pins and t-shirts and hats. And um, it, was, it was this kind of crazy thing. And um, so we went and just worked with and hired camera people all over the world to interview creators at these different events and go and interview fans. And um, so we ended up with like footage from... I think now, now we've collected a lot over dozens, dozens of countries. Um, initially, it wasn't as much, but it started. Um, and uh, we were really onto something. And I think at that point, we started cutting that footage together. And we made basically a little teaser trailer, which is pretty close to the thing that's on, uh, was on our, our Kickstarter that's on, on YouTube now. And we sent that to Mike. And what do you guys response? And he was like... How did you get my phone number? <laughs> who is it? New phone, who did? Um, he, and he was very, uh, he was very open to it. He was like, oh, okay. And, you know, I knew Mike from, he'd been a guest at Emerald City and he'd been a guest at my new show, Lightbox Expo. And um, so between those two, he, I, I at least had a track record of not being some rando that you know again like how'd you get this number and instead it was like yeah okay like you know if, since it's you i'll, I'll let, let's give it a shot and so then we were able to sit down and do our first big interview with mignola which then opened a lot of doors for us of course after we had him on board then we started wanting to talk to a lot of his collaborators they were very open to being part of this and it just kind of uh you know it was a, a snowball rolling downhill after that once yeah. Mike Manila gets involved in something like this, because now you're dealing with the actual person, does that affect how you approach the story? Because once again, you have to be a little more sensitive because the guy is now attached directly. Is there certain areas or landmines you had to avoid in an attempt to maybe not, you know, or bother the, there, the, the star of your show? There, there were things that we were like, we approached delicately. Like, you know, for instance, his mom died when he was very young. And Jim and I were very careful to like go, is this okay? Is this something you want to talk about? Um, is, you know, is your relationship with Guillermo del Toro something you want to talk about? And we would talk to him. We wouldn't get into details, but we would kind of like check in and like move forward. And he was, but he was um, honestly a little surprisingly open. Uh, he was very willing to talk. Uh, there wasn't anything that, I don't think we had any no fly zones. There was things that we were careful with approaching, but once we approached, we talked about pretty much everything. Yeah. Creating this film, was there anything that surprised you or what surprised you most about Mike Mendoza and his life? Um, did anything surpass your expectations of who he was or an aspect of his story that became more interesting or larger than 
you thought just reading whatever wiki page or whatever originally um, gave you some background information on them? I feel like um, for me, I think it was that um, finding out more about his relationship with the the media that has been created around Hellboy. Um, Because I think a lot of people feel once once Hellboy become Hellboy became kind of pop part part of pop culture, right? So that that can be a hard thing when the thing you created is sort of no longer like your little thing, right? And I feel like that was a, a big a big part of the conversation we had, which is how does it feel to see your the thing that you were like, I'm just going to draw this little comic book about a red guy with a tail turn into here we are 25 years later, celebrating it worldwide. Mm. Um, So I think that to me was the biggest aspect that I found so interesting as we were talking to him about his kind of like his life with Hellboy. Yeah. He's a big one. So, I mean, luckily, I mean, he's still alive, Mike Mandola, um, still actively creating, not to, that we know of. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that we know of. Um, when, when, we, when, you, when you're thinking about making this film about him, how do you determine the end point of a story that's still ongoing? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I hope we did a good job. But yeah. the, the answer is, um, you know, you, you can't, again, sort of from the Wikipedia, the movie joke, which is, you have to figure out what feels satisfying as a good conclusion to the story. And for us, what we found was um, that he has said he's retired multiple times and yet he continues to create. And so our documentary ends in a way much like his current career is ending which is that it's not the movie ends being like when you're a creative you're gonna create until you're no longer on this earth and that was in a way also like the conclusion of the film which is yep like we're just gonna i'm just gonna keep doing this thing no matter what because i'm an artist and that's what i do Mm. yeah we trick you it's a little bit of a wind down where you think like Okay, he's quitting for good. And this is a send off. And he just pops back and goes, Nope, I'm, I'm still going. <laughs> well, that does seem to be a real thing. But like as you mentioned about creatives, it's hard to just put, you know, put that pencil down as it were and just quit. I mean, Hellboy, they, I know they killed off the character, but it, those stories kind of keep going. I mean, I imagine a brain like his just keeps on pumping new ideas all the time, regardless who wants to or not at this point. Yeah, it's a real problem. He can't stop. <laughs> stop when they drag him out of there <laughs> so w- was that re- the idea of him retiring or not retiring or continuously retiring whatever you want to phrase it was that what you would call the narrative thread of the film no 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 i th- I, the, the, I think the narrative thread of the film and jim feel free to jump in but is about finding your voice and finding your creative voice and finding your place in the world and that if you can, and if you do um, rolling that forward so you can create a place for other people who are like you. So another great thing about Mike Manola is that he has also risen to a point of fame that Mm -hmm. is kind of like that upper stratosphere that is um, let's say, well, let's say well beyond what most of us can experience. How do you also make sure he's identifiable to an audience who is may never ever experience that level of legend. I mean, I think if you meet Mike Mignola, there's nothing about him that there's no pretense. There's no, like the last person that would take Mike seriously is Mike. (laughs) And because of that, he's very relatable in that, He's just a guy who wanted to make comics and do his creative thing. And it worked out. 
but there's nothing about him. You know, I feel like I get kind of what you're saying. Someone like, I don't know, like a Tom Cruise, you're like, that's a level of success and fame that like is not going to get experienced by too many people. Mike can go to the grocery store and buy, you know, a dozen eggs and he's not going to get um, harassed for autographs. You know what I mean? It's, it's a much different level. And so he's, he's very relatable already. Thanks to that. And, and that helps a lot. So but once again, um, interesting thing about documentary as well is that you're telling a story for entertainment, but you're also telling a truth. Is there a point where story and truth um, don't um, or run parallel to one another or, or affect how you tell the other part of the story? Or is there any point where entertainment affects, you know what I'm saying, the truth of the story you're trying to well, tell? And we're not, yeah, no, everything we did is, everything in the story is 100% like true we're not doing any reality show style setups of like you know tr- tricky questions or anything like that we just wanted to kind of get it what mike's journey and mike's story was um you know definitely you edit a lot out because you edit a lot of details out because you know mike talks about flying to new york and he tells us this really engaging 45 minute story about his trying to figure out where he stayed and we just cut out all the middle stuff and just get to the punchline, you know? And so like, there's a lot of that kind of stuff to make it fit. And there's like stuff that we left out because it's, it was interesting, but doesn't, act, you know, it just like, it didn't move the story forward. It's like, Oh, you worked on this really cool thing. We really like this thing. And he's like, yeah, I drew it. What was going on in your life? Nothing. Did you learn anything while doing it? Not really. You know? And so we're like, okay, next, <laughs> let's go to the next, book, the next book where you experience more, you know? So I, I mean, I, I guess you're mindful of like what goes in and, and what is, you know, part of a featurette or that can stay in Wikipedia type stuff. Mm. So, I mean, some of your guests are really impressive. You have Adam Savage is uh, one of the guests, uh, Neil Gaiman is one of the guests. How did you land those interviews? Uh, how did you, I mean, did they come to you? Did you think, you know, it would be interesting for Mike Manola, Adam Savage from Mythbuster. I mean, how, how did you choose who to talk to and, and, was, and did they come to you or did you go to them? Not, not, no one was the same way. Uh, everyone was like through like networks and spider webs. And um, I forgot who got who, but I know. Um, I oh, think you got, I got him you, man. Yeah. you reached out to his assistant. So yeah. part of this and now to, to answer your question in a roundabout way, Jeff, part of this was actually just research. Like yeah. for us, we started looking into, you know, all right, who's sort of like an avowed Mignola fan and has like mentioned it publicly. So for example, Adam Savage is a good, a good example is Adam Savage where he has done like a one, he does these things called one day builds where he builds stuff on tested.com and he built a a sword from a cover to a Hellboy cop. So he's been very public about his love of Hellboy. So we reached out through his agent and we're like, hey, we know he's a big fan. We're doing this documentary. At this point, we've interviewed a few people so we can show that we're being serious. And thanks to that, he said yes. So it was things like that, like Rebecca Sugar, another person who has talked publicly about being influenced by Mike Mignola. So we're like, okay, why don't we reach out to her and talk to her? So um, a lot of it came like that. So I mean, you're interviewing some of these fascinating people like Adam Savage, Neil Gaiman, while you're um, doing documentaries on Mike Mignola, is that now creating a spark to now do a documentary on Neil Gaiman and Adam Savage and those guys as well? Or, I mean, how far ahead are we thinking about who you want to talk to next? Well, we definitely want to do more movies like this. We definitely want to tell stories about creators. And basically, I think kind of our ethos is to tell the stories about the people who made the things you love. So some variation on that, right? Mm. And so like, and you know, we love talking to and working with Neil Gaiman and with Adam Savage and with Rebecca Sugar, like pretty much everyone on it, you know. Um, so, you know, but we're still kind of figuring stuff out for what comes next. So one thing that I read, so on August 13th, 2022, Mike Manola Drawing Monsters will be shown at the Million Dollar Theater in Los Angeles. Now, yes. prior to that, 
you're showing a film for <laughs> like the boy glove. <laughs> um, you're showing a screening of The Bride of Frankenstein. Now, I I imagine there's a connection here somewhere, but uh, you may want to walk us through it a little bit. Sure. I mean, That's it's the only film available. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's just turns out no other movies, just that one. Um, <laughs> only one that would do I mean, it for your budget. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I think it's part of what Secret Movie Club d- did. They pitched to us doing it as a double feature and asked what we'd be interested in. And we lobbed it to Mike. And Mike chose to requested that we do Bride of Frankenstein because it's uh, one of his all time favorite movies and been very influential on him. And, um, and you know, it, it's not like a major part of our film or anything, but he does mention um, Frankenstein and going to old movies quite a few times in our documentary. So how does understanding his love for Bride of Frankenstein <clears throat> help you understand Mike Minola? Oh, that's a good. It's a long, how do you put it? It's a, uh, it's a culmination of influences, right? So if you look at Mike Mignola's work now, the way he uses shadow, the way he uses his storytelling visually, not just to the writing, um, you can trace that back to the films and art that he was influenced by. Because everyone is just a distillation of all the things that they were fans of. And then they take it and put their own spin on it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like being able to watch something like Bride of Frankenstein back to back with something like Drawing Monsters, where you can then draw a through line to go, okay, I can see how parts of what he does were made by all these little pieces smushed together into Mike Mignola. So, so for all our listeners who may not make it to LA on the 13th, when can they get their hands on Mike Manila drawing monsters? We're working on it <laughs> <laughs> right now. Uh, our next, uh, our next thing is uh, actually fulfilling our Kickstarter. Cause you know, we couldn't have done this film without our Kickstarter backers. Um, we're just in about three weeks fulfilling the, the Kickstarter. So everyone's getting the Blu-rays, the digital t-shirts, you know, all the stuff we made for the, uh, uh, for the Kickstarter. And then after that, we're um, kind of just shopping around and figuring out where we can distribute this film. So uh, once we know, we'll let you know and you can let your readers know. I, I, look, I look forward to it. Like I said, it sounds awesome. I'm a big Mike Manola fan. For- Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, you too. <laughs>